know why you're here. We have a special guest this evening, Dr. John Hansenson. He's the district historian for the Corps of Engineers in St. Paul. Uh, he's a graduate of the University of Minnesota and has specialized in North in the last 10 years, especially on history in the upper Midwest, especially the role of the river and the development along it. Um, he's going to be showing slides talking about the development along the river. And I'm going to actually do, do two things tonight. One is a lecture about, uh, and I hope it's not just a lecture, I hope if you want to ask questions or participate, please do. Um, one is a, is a history of the Mississippi River, trying to, trying to show people how it looked before today. Um, how it looked 100 years ago. The other, the other part of the lecture is, is really about uh, some historic photographs that, that we've discovered recently. Uh, a poster which was on the back there by a photographer named Henry Bossy, um, who worked for the, the Rock Island District of the Corps of Engineers uh, versus the St. Paul District. Uh, let me turn the lights down. This is, a, this is the St. Paul District of the Corps of Engineers. So people, when I say the St. Paul District, I don't know if some of the kids realize that we don't just cover the city of St. Paul. The St. Paul District covers uh, everything in the Wisconsin River drainage system to the, to the Souris River drainage system, the Cheyenne River, the Red River, the Minnesota, and, uh, and the Mississippi down to Guthrie, Iowa. That's the, that's the area that, that I work in. Uh, it's a, the Corps of Engineers is a water resource uh, agency, so we focus on our boundaries are, of course, related to uh, water resources, river basins. So part of my, part of my talk is going is to focus on how the Corps of Engineers has engineered the Mississippi and changed the Mississippi. And part of it is, is to, to talk about these historic photographs that we have. For those of you who are, uh, how many are familiar with the photographs or heard about these historic photographs that we have? Okay, so most of the most of the young people have. Let me just let me just review a little bit, and I can update some people and clarify some things on the photographs that we have. Uh, they were done by a German immigrant who came to the United States in about 1870. Uh, he eventually ended up working for the Corps of Engineers, and in about 1875, we know he's in St. Paul working for the Corps of Engineers, and then went down to Rock Island and worked for them after 1878. Um, he was, a, he was a grandson of a famous German count. Um, the count who is, or the, or the strategist, the military strategist, who is credited with defeating Napoleon at Waterloo. And he was the, the grandson of this uh, strategist or general. Um, about a year ago, I received a call from a Washington antique dealer. And he had this, this photographic album of about 169 blue oval photographs, uh, ovals about this big. They're called cyanotypes because they were blue. Cyan is a blue color, and, and if you've ever seen cyanide, the chemical is blue. In the process by which they made these photographs, they used, they used uh, uh, cyanide, not directly, but an iron ion that had cyanide. So that's all the photographs have a blue tint to them. Um, he had been offered $20,000 for these photographs um, by an by a antique dealer. This is the Upper Mississippi River Basin that I'm going to focus on, the Upper Mississippi River that I'm going to focus on. And this is the, this is the, the cover page to the, to the photographs. Um, it says, views, views on the Mississippi River between Minneapolis and St. Louis are negatives taken and printed under the direction of Major A. McKenzie, Corps of Engineers by H. Bossy Drotson, 1883-1891. The Drotson was a draftsman, and at that time a draftsman did many, many things. Uh, through maps, uh, he was a cartographer, he took photographs, he drew sketches, uh, and Henry Bossy did all of those things. And he did them exceptionally well, so exceptionally well that, that this photograph, this photographic album uh, was he, the guy who owned it was offered twenty thousand dollars. He then called up the, the St. Paul district and asked, uh, did any did any other albums like this exist in, in the core anywhere? Part of his concern was, of course, if no other albums existed, this would work a lot more. Uh, but he wanted to know if there are other albums that existed. 
Well, I, I knew we had some black and white oval photographs of the, of the Mississippi River. I knew I'd seen those somewhere. Somebody down in our public affairs office, and, and they were in the public affairs office, but they were modern reprints. Well, I stayed in contact with this guy who owned the book, and, and about the third time I talked to him, and about the third time I was flipping through the book, I noticed that there was a, another photograph sandwiched between two others. And I pulled it out, and on the cover of that it said, uh, uh, presented to U.S. Dredge William A. Thompson by Mrs. William A. Thompson. That's the Dredge Thompson. It's the principal dredge boat uh, for the Corps of Engineers on the Upper Mississippi River. Well, when I saw that, I immediately called up our chief of maintenance, who was in charge of dredging in the Mississippi River, and I asked him if he'd ever seen anything like this, uh, of a double of blue photographs. And he told me that when, he, when our photographer had since retired had uh, uh, taken photographs of these things, he didn't know if they'd turn out because they were blue. And so we, we checked immediately to see if the photographs were on the Thompson still, which was down in St. Louis, and it turned out there was an album of photographs, blue photographs on the Dredge Thompson. Um, and they're in the captain's office, which is on the upper deck. <coughs> we waited uh, until the boat got back up to uh, St. Paul. We were worried about the uh, security. Uh, but $20,000 at that time was not a, a high price. There's equipment on the dredge worth much more than $20,000. And it's probably one of the most secure places it could have been. Uh, it, had, it had been there possibly for over 50 years. William Thompson was a Corps of Engineers uh, uh, engineer had worked for the Corps for 44 years. And he had worked in Rock Island District with Henry Bossy, the photographer, and with Major, Ma Major McKenzie for 16 years. And when Major McKenzie left in 1896, it was the same year that uh, William Thompson left. And, and my guess is they both received albums when they left and knew Henry Bossy very well. So it was a, it was a personal album of uh, William Thompson. He died in 1924. And in 1937, they built this dredge, and they christened it the William A. Thompson. Uh, and so at that time, it's my guess, um, his wife donated the album back to the dredge and gave it to the Corps of Engineers again. And from 1937 until 1990, it went up and down the Mississippi River on that dredge. The, the owner of the book in Washington brought it to Sotheby's. Sotheby's is the principal auction house in America, the biggest auction house in America, selling art and, and other antiques. And the, the head of photography for Sotheby's was astonished at the photographs and at their clarity and their artistic composition. And she said of all the photographs she'd seen in 10 years of work in photography, these ranked among the top 10 that she'd ever seen of the, of the late 19th century. And Sotheby's valued the album at $40,000 to $60,000. And it sold in the fall auction last year, last October, for $66,000. The buyer of the album then called me two weeks later, after about two or three weeks later after he had the album. And he said, he thought possibly he said, undersold the album. It was sold in the biggest auction they'd ever had. They had to cap out this thick of photographs that were in that auction. And he valued the album. He said that day he could get $650,000 for the album. Uh, and he, he estimated that when he was all done with that album, it would be worth a million and a half dollars. So that's, that's kind of the art value of these photographs. I'm not an art historian. Um, so I can't speak to that. I can speak to more about what those photographs tell you about the Mississippi River. And, and Henry Blossie's photograph will help me talk about the Mississippi River and help you understand the Mississippi River as it existed a hundred years ago. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna begin with the Mississippi River today. Today there are 29 locks and dams on the Mississippi River. They run from St. Anthony Falls down to just above St. Louis, Missouri. And they create something called the Nine Foot Channel. We may have heard that term, the Nine Foot Channel, many times. That doesn't mean that the Mississippi River is only 90 feet deep. Okay, what that means is that if the river ever gets as low as it did in 1864, a very severe drought year, there will still be at least nine feet of water in the channel. And this shows what the, what the locks and dams have done, is they've created a series of reservoirs, essentially a staircase of water, which you have to go through locks and dams to get up river. They guarantee that nine foot depth throughout the navigation season. Here's a lock and dam in Hastings. I hope I have this one facing the right way. <laughs> it, was a, it was a one I wasn't positive of. 
other locks and dams on the Mississippi. You can see how much water there is in the river and how, how wide the river basin is. Lock and dam number four at all. A modern, um, these locks and dams, uh, about 1930, there was very little commerce on the Mississippi River. Less than a million tons of commerce on the Mississippi River. Uh, today, these, these barges carry over 70 to 80 million tons of commerce on the Mississippi River each year. One 15 barge tow, like this one, which is a standard size for the upper Mississippi, they're so big they have to go through the locks in two sections. They bring through the first three, the set of three, uh, three by three or nine barges, and then they have to bring through the towboat and the other barges. One of those, one of those towboats is the equivalent of 870 <coughs> semi trucks, or the equivalent of two and a half railroad trains with 100 cars each. So this is the Mississippi River as it looks today. <coughs> what is the Upper Mississippi River today? It's a very carefully managed river or control, some people might argue. It's also a vital commercial highway, something I think most of us take for granted. It's also a treasured natural resource for hunting, boating, and fishing. You can see the boats in front of the, or on the bottom side of the dam where the, the water here is irrigated by, the, by going over the, over the roller gates there. This is a, a far, far different river from the river that existed and flowed through this valley for thousands of years. It's a far different river than it might have been had Congress continued with navigation projects that it had authorized in 1878 and then in 1907. What was the Upper Mississippi River like before any improvements were made? What was it like, essentially, in its, in its natural condition? <coughs> this, is a, this is a slide that's showing you tonnage. It's a little out of data, but it, can show, it shows you how dramatically tonnage has risen on the Mississippi River. Mississippi River um, in about 1878, okay, or, or 1877 maybe. And this is at Miniger, which is just just about Prescott, okay. And the dark blue areas represent the deep channel. That was where it was three feet deep at low water, okay. Which with low water happened frequently in the fall. The, unlike unlike today, the you really notice in the spring you get the spring runoff and the river would go way up. But by midsummer it started dropping, and by fall it would be very low, unless there were a lot. There was a lot of rain. So what, what else you had is you had the, the three, three and a half foot or three foot channel running for a little ways, then broken and stopped, and then it would go around an island and off towards a slough, where you'd have to pick it up on the on the underside of another island. There was no continuous channel in the Mississippi River. Again, you can see that the darker blue is the three foot deep channel, and the lighter blue is even shallower. So again, there's, if you're, a, if you're a, a raft pilot or a, a boat pilot or a steamboat captain, how do you find the channel to navigate it? This was the river that was there at the time of Mark Twain and of George Merrick, who was a, a resident of Prescott for a while. Steamboat pilots, according to Merrick, had to memorize every bluff, hill, rock, tree, stump, house, wood pile, and whatever else is noted along the riverbanks. He further added to this fund of information a photographic negative in his line, showing the shape of all the curves, bends, capes, and points of the river's bank, so that he may shut his eyes and yet see it all, and with such certainty that he can, on a night so perfectly black that the shoreline is blotted out, run his boat within 50 feet of the shore, dodge snakes, wrecks, overhanging trees, and all other obstacles by running the shape of the river as he knows it to be, not as he can see it. That's, that's, that's what Mark Twain says as well about the Mississippi River and the pilots. They had to know the river so well that when they came to this area where the, the channel ended, they had to know where the next channel began, simply by the trees and the markers along the riverbank. Otherwise, they could, they could end up with their, their steamboat on, the, on a shoal area. He said the worst, the, the worst uh, bars in the entire Mississippi were Beef Slough near Olympia, Wisconsin, Great Claw just below St. Paul, Pig's Eye, which is just below St. Paul, and Prescott. Soundings were carefully taken over these areas. Merrick says again, the artistic quality of piloting, piloting 
developed in handling the boat under usual conditions, in making the multitudinous crossings, dodging reefs, and hunting for the best water. This was a river before 1866, before the Civil War, or, or up to the end of the Civil War. Steamboats had been using the Mississippi River beginning in 1823 when the Virginia was the first steamboat to come up the Mississippi River from St. Louis to Fort Snelling in St. Paul. After that, about by 1841, 44 steamboats arrival, arrivals were recorded in St. Paul. In 1849, 95 steamboats came to St. Paul. But during the 1850s, traffic boomed on the upper Mississippi. In 1857 and 1858, over 1,000 steamboat landings are recorded in St. Paul. Below, at, down at Winona, over 1,700 steamboat landings were recorded in 1857. Downstream, these boats carried mostly agricultural produce, cranberries, potatoes, barley, oats, wheat, and flour. There was no other way to get those, get those commodities out of the Midwest. Upstream, they transported groceries, dry goods, machinery, and people, immigrants to the upper Mississippi Valley. Again, there was no other way except by, by trails uh, to get those commodities and people to the upper Mississippi Valley. During the heyday of steamboating, Congress authorized no significant or permanent river improvement projects. So the river was essentially as you see it in this condition. This is, a, this is the first uh, Henry Bossy photograph. This is, this is one of the few photographs that, that you really don't see much change in. And here, here you can see the, the side channels in the, in, the, in the islands in the middle of the river. And, and as a steamboat captain, which, which one of those routes do you take? Where is the best water? Which, one, which channel might have the snakes or a wreck in it? The initial improvements on the Mississippi River began in 1829 when engineers began surveying the Rock Island and Des Moines rapids. Um, those were the worst rapids on the Mississippi River as they were all rock lined. They were the ones that damaged boats most. That, the Corps did very little work on the Upper Mississippi prior to the Civil War. It wasn't until 1866 that Congress created the St. Paul District and the Rock Island District and began working a little more seriously on the Upper Mississippi River. But they only authorized, they authorized some more work on the Rock Island and, and Des Moines Rapids, but they also authorized snagging, uh, that is pulling the, the trees out of the water that are in the water. Uh, they authorized dredging and they authorized clearing. By, by dredging at this time, they didn't mean like the Thompson where they had big suction hydraulic dredges that sucked the mud out of the, or the sand out of the river. Or they didn't even mean that necessarily the dipper dredges that scoop it out and might put it on a barge. All they did was they would try to stir up the water or run a scraper across one of the bars and hope that the, the river could suspend it enough to carry it somewhere else so it wouldn't be a problem. Sometimes they would, they would sit with the paddle wheel of a steamboat right over the bar, churning for two days to stir up the water enough to get the, the sand to go down the stream. <coughs> but except, except for the work at the Rock Islands, there was no, again, no permanent work on the upper Mississippi River. It essentially didn't change this condition because with the next flood, the sandbars could reform and you could find more trees in, in the river. The four and a half foot channel is the first effort to improve the Mississippi. In 1878, Congress authorized uh, this first system-wide project to improve the Mississippi, this first permanent effort to improve the Mississippi River. It's called the four and a half foot channel because it, it was supposed to be four and a half feet above low water. That is, if it got to four and a half, if it got as low as it did in 1864, you'd still have four and a half feet of water in the channel. How was the core to create this channel? Well, it was to do it with, with new dredges, like the Phoenix here. All of the bossy photographs are oval and they're all blue, so you feel like this, clearly distinguish them from the others. The dredge Phoenix, and the General Barnard, another uh, uh, snag boat and, and utility boat for the upper Mississippi River. But dredging and snagging could not establish a permanent channel. <clears throat> In addition to dredging and snagging and clearing, the Corps began constricting the channel to begin narrowing it and concentrating its flow into a single channel. They did this with what are called wing dams and closing dams. The wing dams 
on the long piers that are alternating layers of rock in little mats that were sunk into the river. The first the brush or the willow saplings had to be cut, then they had to be towed on a barge to the site where they needed to be used, but then they had to be laid in the river in a, in a long continuous mat. <coughs> They also needed stone, and the bluffs along the Mississippi supplied much of the, the rock for the, for the wing dams. And here they are, actually throwing uh, rock onto the dam, the wing dam, sinking them in. And if they needed another layer, then they would put another layer of the willow mats up and sink those as well. And one of the problems that the wing dams created is that by going out into the river, they threw the river to the other side of it to the other side, eating away at the bank on the other side. And what you can see over here is they've begun to riprap that side of the bank, clearing it and riprapping it. And you can see the part that's, that's not. So along with the wing dams, went shore protection as well. <clears throat> and what did the wing dams and closing dams do? This is, a, this is the one from the pulsar, if you've seen it. A series of these wing dams placed in the river created the same effect as a garden hose that you turn down and so it goes really fast. What that does is you steam that garden hose at some dirt or something and it washes it away really quickly. So what that, that what that could do is if there was a sandbar hip over in this part of the river, it was like turning down that garden hose. You scour it out, the water's moving faster, it, it, it's holding more sediment. It's like if you took a glass of water and stirred up some sand or something and it would all suspend up into the, into the water as long as it's moving. It'll stay up in the water. And then what happens is, it, the water curls around the end of the wing dam, it moves slower, and everything drops out of it. So what you're doing is you're, creating, you're moving the sandbar from here to here, 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 all the way down the river. And here, you're starting to create the first continuous navigational channel in the Mississippi River. You're also changing the landscape of the Mississippi River, though. The Mississippi River is no longer going to be this wide expanse with many different channels. What it's going to be is a much more narrow, much narrower river because as that sand fills in more and more, trees begin growing out of the, out of the willow mats. Willows start growing up and other vegetation starts growing. Had they continued with this project, the river today would look far different than it does now. The, the, the problem with wing dams, however, is that. They only work with the water in the river. If there's no water in the river, they don't work very well. During high water, when the, when the floods came, when the spring floods came, water would flow right over the top of the wing dams and there'd be no problem. As the water went down in the fall, in the late summer, it would be forced into the main channel. But if it went down really low, like during the drought of 88, it's just moving. You can't even, you'd have to narrow it down too much to even have a, a good navigational channel, and it just wouldn't work. And the wing dams didn't work very well at that point. So what the, what the Corps did was they built a series of uh, dams in the headwaters of the Mississippi <clears throat> at Lake Winnebogoshish, at Okegamon, Pine River, and Sandy Lake, and Gull Lake, and Leech Lake. All of those are, are reservoirs that were created with the idea of storing the spring runoff, releasing it in the fall when the water got low, so that you could increase the flow of water in the Mississippi below the Twin Cities. It didn't work very well, however, because they only got about three tenths of a, a foot uh, down by this, by this area where the photographs are showing, so it didn't increase the water level a lot. And it helped the Millers at St. Anthony Falls considerably, and, and there's an argument that that's what was really done for. <laughs> Both Twain and Merrick complained about the timing of river improvements. Why had not river improvements come earlier during the heyday of steamboating on the Mississippi River? One of the principal reasons was that there, wasn't, there weren't enough people in the upper Midwest to justify it. Wisconsin, in 1850, had a population of about 305,000. Iowa had a population of 192,000. Minnesota had a population, and it was still a territory, of 6,000. By 1880, two years, about two years after this project was authorized, Wisconsin's population has, has grown over a million. It's up to a million three. Iowa's population has grown almost by a million four. It's up to a million, 1.6 million people. And the Midwest overall during this era grew from 5.4 million uh, in 1850 to 17 million 
in 1880. And with those people, with the political power and to influence Congress for such a project. It was for the people in all the Mississippi River. Oops, let me just go through these real quick. This again is a, a, a picture before improvement. Okay, you look at Big Guy Island. When you see they put a closing dam in, cut off the channel. Okay, you're forcing the channel to the other side of the island, and you get a continuous channel. Again, Nittinger Mar, one of the worst places. That's what it looked like before the improvement and after. They put again a closing dam at the top of the island and the bottom of the island, forcing all the water to the, to the main channel. And, and what some of you should think about, especially if there's students interested in biology and here, what does this do to the environment of, of, the, of the backwater areas? Denying water to the backwater areas, in this case, uh, and cutting them off. And increasing scholar through other parts of the channel that didn't used to have. <coughs> Here's a bigger view of the river, uh, Pig's Eye Island. The top being before improvement, this channel is going to go up and down and, and all over the place. And then the bottom is after the wing dams are put in. You can see the density of the wing dams being put in, how many there are. Here's Pine Bend, which is just above Hastings and Prescott area. And if you look at the interior of this, of the, if you look right in here, you can see how open it is. They put closing dams in across the channel. Okay. That's 1885, and here's 1891. Six years later, you can see what's happening. Again, the landscape of the Mississippi is changing significantly due to the way the wind dams are working. They're doing their job, is what they're doing there. It was for the towns of the Upper Mississippi, it was for the people of the Upper Mississippi that the, that the project was authorized for. And in all of Henry Bossie's photographs are for a purpose. If he shows you a picture of the river with wing dams, it's to show you the wing dam project. If he shows you pictures of towns, it's to make the argument that this is, this is, for, who, this is for who the project is for. It's for the people of the Upper Mississippi. And some of his town photographs are the probably most beautiful photographs at all. Dresbach, Minnesota. Somewhat of a New England uh, type look. In Soto, Wisconsin, and, and this, I'm not an art historian, but I've talked to a few people who are uh, art historian types. And, and you can see Henry Bossy continually uses, or he often uses someone in his photograph, and he keeps their head right at the, the, the horizon line. So they're just about at that horizon. He'll have them bending over if he has to so they don't break that horizon. But in this case, he uses his line up through the beach, up through the man, and up through the bluff, the high area, to create another continuous line. It's, he could have taken just he could have taken pictures of towns without really working on the art aspect of it. But he but he took time. He was an artist as well as, a, as an engineer. Minieska. Yeah, and Twain talks about the cities on hills throughout uh, his trip in 1882 up the Mississippi River. About the time, just after these photographs, or before these photographs are taken. Again, the man is centered in the picture with the church of in. Chenoa, Wisconsin. This time the man is laying down so that his movement is with the fence and with the slope of the hill. And the railroad truck's coming in and out of the photograph and extending the line out at the end, toward the end and out toward the river. And Prescott. Gives you a feeling of what Prescott was like in 1885. Pretty much in a frontier town state. <coughs> Timber, the second reason Congress authorized uh, that four and a half foot channel project was for the principal industry of the Mississippi River <coughs> during this era, and that's the timber industry. Timber products dominated the Upper Mississippi River's commerce from the 1870s through the first decade of the 20th century. Timber, more timber products were shipped than any other products on the Mississippi River. They were more valuable than any other product shipped on the Upper Mississippi River. And they're generally shipped further than any other products on the Upper Mississippi River. More than tra passenger traffic or grain hauling, timber shipping justified federal, and federal spending on river improvement. Lumber had begun in Wisconsin and Minnesota 
in about the 1830s. He grew rapidly in the 1840s and 50s. Draft boats, such as this one, guided log and lumber rafts that came from the Mississippi's Wisconsin tributaries and from above the falls of St. Anthony, the sawmills and retailing centers along the upper river between Minneapolis and St. Louis. These mills turned logs and rough lumber into finished lumber, lath, and shingles that they shipped farther down the river or sent by rail to points east, but more often west. Newly arrived immigrants and the rapidly growing domestic population use this lumber to build houses, farm buildings, and business establishments throughout the Midwest. As the railroads completed lines crossing the Mississippi, <clears throat> there was even more, a greater demand for, for uh, lumber in the timberless plains to the west. Rivers offered the cheapest means of shipping logs and lumber. Even after railroads in time entwined the Midwest, lumber was a unique commodity for the river. It floated. It didn't have to do much else with it. And this, this is a photograph, again, where the detail of it is incredible. You see that your eye comes to the raft boat in the middle here. But if you look closely, there are rafts waiting for boats to take them downstream all through here and all through here. So this is uh, from the bluffs at Fulton City, looking upstream in 1885. So you can see the, the extent of the lumber industry. Just to give you an idea of, of how much these rafts carried. Before 1860, the average raft would have carried 300 to 600,000 board feet of lumber. By 1870, some of the rafts carried up to 2 million board feet of lumber. By 1890, a few rafts carried up to 3.5 million board feet of lumber. And then by 20 years later, or 5 years later, a raft carried 7 million board feet. One raft even carried 10 million board feet of lumber. And to put this in perspective, a raft of 2.5 million board feet carried enough timber to build 125 houses and covered three to four acres. Timber shipping on the upper Mississippi River lasted as long as the white pine forests of western Wisconsin <clears throat> and northern Minnesota. Initially, the St. Croix, Black, and Chippewa Rivers of Wisconsin fed the largest quantities of logs and lumber into the Mississippi River. While the Wisconsin River Basin was estimated to hold 130 billion feet of pine in 1840, the largest reserve of timber rested in the Black and Chippewa River Basins. One-sixth of the nation's white pine west of the Appalachians was in the Chippewa River Valley alone. By 1892, however, the quantity of lumber expelled from the Wisconsin's, tri from Wisconsin's tributaries began to climb. From 718 million uh, feet of lumber, Mailed <clears throat> along these tributaries in 1892, the, the amount fell to 465 million in 1900 and 123 million in 1909. So from 700 million to 123 million, it fell in a, in a period of uh, about uh, 15, 16 years. Masking this decline, however, covering up for this decline in shipping on the river, the mills above the Twin Cities began furnishing more and more logs and lumber because the, the milling began earlier in, in, in Wisconsin and later in northern Minnesota. By 1897, the sawmills in Minneapolis and above produced more than the Mississippi's Wisconsin tributaries. Overall, between 1892 and 1900, the peak year of the lumber industry, 1.6 to 2.1 billion feet of lumber moved into and on the upper Mississippi River each year. After turning out 2 billion feet of lumber in 1901, the lumber milling industry began collapsing. With the, with the decline of the lumber industry <clears throat> came the decline in the number of, of mills along the river and the number of raft boats. At its peak years in 1893 and 19, 1894, the lumber industry employed 100 raft boats and 100 sawmills on the Mississippi River between Minneapolis and St. Louis. The number of sawmills dropped to 80 by 1900. Three years later, there were only 36. And 10 years later, 1913, there was only one left on the Upper Mississippi, one saw mill left on the Upper Mississippi River that used the Upper Mississippi River for shipping. Raft boats followed a similar decline. Of the more than 100 raft boats plying the Upper Mississippi River in 1893, only 86 remained on the river in 1900. By 1912, there were only four. In 1915, 
The last raft boat on the Mississippi River carried the last raft from Hudson, Wisconsin, to this picture, to this to this site at Fort Madison, Iowa. The main one, and this was the last lumberyard left on the Mississippi. Below singing the folks. You just if you look at the size of the stacks of lumber there compared to the buildings, you get a feel for how much lumber is at that site. <clears throat> The lumber industry's collapse exposed the river's failure as a transportation river. During the last third of the 19th century, it had not been able to attract any other commodities. The Mississippi River had become a one-commodity river. <coughs> Once the river had carried thousands of immigrants and tons of grain, but the railroad had taken these away from the river. When the timber was no longer available, the river ceased to be a meaningful part of the Midwest transportation network. Other commodities still moved on the river, but they didn't move very far. They might move from St. Paul to Prescott, or Prescott to La Crosse, but they didn't move very far or in very much quantity. Railroads had begun taking traffic from the steamboats by the mid 1850s. The first railroad reaches the Upper Mississippi River at Rock Island in 1854, and another reached Alton, Illinois, just above St. Louis that same year. And the, over the next four years, seven more railroads reached the Mississippi River. One crosses in 1856 and is immediately hit by a steamboat and burned. <laughs> some, some people claim it was rather deliberate. They could never prove that. And it, was a, it was a case, the, the legal battle that ensued over that involved uh, Abraham Lincoln as one of the lawyers for the bridge company. By 1880, by the economic panic of 1877, the Great Depression, or the Great Depression of 1857, before the Civil War, and the Civil War, interrupted further railroad expansion across the Mississippi. But with the, with the war's end, railroads began expanding rapidly. Between 1866 and 1869, three railroad bridges crossed into Iowa alone. By 1880, 13 railroad bridges had crossed the Upper Mississippi River. Railroads destroyed the river in, in, in three phases, essentially. The first, those railroads reaching the Mississippi River at La Crosse and at, at the, uh, the Twin Cities and, and at uh, Rock Island. What they did is they cut into the river in different places. And so instead of moving from St. Paul to St. Louis, traffic had moved from St. Paul to La Crosse, one of the first railheads up here in East, or it could move from between La Crosse and the Twin Cities to La Crosse. And you started breaking the river up into shorter and shorter segments with those railroads. Next, railroads began crossing the Mississippi River. In those cities on the west bank that used to be important, uh, steamboat landings and uh, steamboat depots lost that road as the railroads took care of it. Finally, railroads began extending lines paralleling the river, taking away even that short haul of commodities between ports. Twain captures, Mark Twain captures well what this meant for grain shipping on the Upper Mississippi River. Recounting what a clerk on a paddle wheel told him in 1882, he wrote, Boat used to land, captain on a hurricane run, mighty stiff and straight, iron ramrod for a spine, kid gloves, blood tile, hair parted behind. Man on shore takes off his hat and says, We've got 28 tons of wheat, captain. Be a great favor if you can take them. The captain says, I'll take two of them and don't even condescend to look at it. But nowadays, the captain takes off his old slouch and smiles all the way around to the back of his ears and gets off a bomb which he hasn't got any ramrod to interfere with and says, Glad to see you, Mr. Smith. Glad to see you. You're looking well. I haven't seen you looking so well for years. What do you got for us? Nothing, says Smith. Keeps his hat on, turns around, turns his back. It goes on talking to somebody else. That's the change in less than 30 years on the, on the Upper Mississippi with the coming of railroads. For the moment, railroads met Mr. Smith's needs. Railroads presented steamboats with another problem. Railroads were the bridges were the principal offset of two navigation on the Upper Mississippi River. Major McKenzie, under his direction, the photographs are taken, constantly complains <coughs> about bridges and, and the danger they represent. This is a wagon bridge at Winona uh, in the foreground. There's a railroad bridge going underneath. Henry Bossy, one of the one of the things the artists are saying about Henry Bossy, Bossy the, the people who know photography, is that he's able to photograph the landscapes like the wing dams below him in a photograph. 
was in the, in the beautiful photographs of the city. But he's also capable of quoting an extremely technical subject like bridges and, and doing it very well. Why couldn't steamboats uh, compete with railroads? Railroads move their freight faster, giving users greater flexibility in responding to market changes. Rail lines were generally shorter and more direct, and covering a, and in covering a broader area, they could go where they wanted to, essentially. They created a great gathering network. Compatibility between rail lines made transshipment unnecessary. One of the key problems with the Upper Mississippi River is that to ship something from the Upper Mississippi to the Lower Mississippi, you'd carry it down on one of those small barges like I just had up here. Then in St. Louis, you'd have to put it on bigger barges to carry it down river to make it, to make it economically uh, sound. <laughs> Railroads didn't have to do that by this time. They could move right, they could move straight through. <clears throat> and trains ran when the river was high. And they ran when it was low. They ran when the cold of winter froze the river. And for the, for the most part, they ran all year round. Those railroads that ran east to west took advantage of complementary markets. Farmers in the Midwest could ship their grain and other products to the east, and in return, the trains would come back with manufactured products. If a steamboat came up the Mississippi, or went from the upper Mississippi with grain down to St. Louis or New Orleans, there was no guarantee of a return cargo. Railroads could always be guaranteed of a return cargo. By 1900, many Midwesterners were blaming the inadequacy of the four and a half foot channel for the demise of shipping on the Mississippi River. Why did Midwesterners care if river traffic died or not? Were they simply longing for this romantic past of the steamboat days of Twain and Merrick? In part, some of them were, but more importantly, railroad rates increased when river competition was not available. What happened on the upper Mississippi River here is that when the river froze sometimes, railroad rates would go immediately up when they stopped hauling. Or if the railroad successfully defeated a steamboat line, rates again would go up. In 1907, responding to pressure from Midwestern states and river improvement organizations, Congress authorized the six-foot channel project. So we go from a four-and-a-half-foot channel project to a six-foot channel project. And what that did is it made more wing dams, more closing dams, more dredging, and by 1930, there were over 1,000 wing dams between St. Paul and La Crosse. In the area of the river above Prescott here, there was an average of 10 wing dams per mile. You can imagine how that's beginning to change the, the landscape of the Mississippi River. Despite this effort, traffic on the Mississippi River continued to decline. 1914, with the, with the completion of the Panama Canal, things became even worse. You might wonder, how can the Panama Canal make things worse for shipping on the Mississippi River? Well, what it did is, in economic terms, it put New York closer to San Francisco than, than New York was to St. Paul. It was cheaper to ship something through the Panama Canal from New York to San Francisco than to ship it on the upper Mississippi River. And what that meant was, industry began leaving the Midwest and threatening to go to the South or the East or the West and, and leave the upper Midwest. And what happened finally, in 1918, there was no through traffic between St. Paul and St. Louis anymore. No riverboats at all made that trip. In 1921, the railroads operating out of Chicago argued that, that the river was, was not a reality. I mean, commerce on the river was not a reality. It was simply a potential. And, that, and what, what Congress had done, or what the Interstate Commerce Commission had done up to that point was, railroads operating along the river could charge cheaper rates because they had to compete with, with steamboats. Railroads operating out of Chicago charged higher rates. And the problem was the steamboats coming out of Chicago, or those railroads coming out of Chicago couldn't compete as effectively with the railroads coming along the river. And so what the railroads coming out of Chicago said was, they sued the Interstate Commerce Commission and said, those, those railroads operating along the, the Mississippi should have to raise their rates. And they won in 1921. For the next four years, Upper Mid Midwesterners fought that decision. And they held it off for four years, but on June 1st, 1925, the Interstate Commerce Commission declared the Upper Midwest landlocked. The St. Paul Pioneer Press in 1928 captured what that meant for the, for the upper Midwest. And I, and I quote an editorial, <clears throat> an editorial here. 
in common with the impulses of all ambitious peoples. The Northwest, in that, in that case it means the Midwest, the Northwest's aspiration for growth, for prosperity, for power, find expression in demand for ready access to the sea. With its millions of population, its rich resources, and its unlimited possibilities for commercial growth, this region is like a giant, tied just beyond the reach of a nobler destiny, straining at his chains. We are landlocked, a marooned interior, shut in by the barriers of costly overland carriage to and from the common highway to the world's markets, the sea. What, what upper Midwesterners did in response to the Indian Reed case decision, which put them on a landlocked basis, is they fought for five years. And, it, and, and that's, a, that's another entire story. In, in a, a one that could be written into a novel, it is, it is so interesting. But over that five years, they succeeded in convincing Congress to authorize the Nine Foot Channel Project, which it does in 1930. The Nine Foot Channel Project is a completely different project from the previous projects. Wing dams, these wing dams that you see here are underwater now. If you get an opportunity to look at a navigation map of the Mississippi, you'll see all these little things under these little marks in the main, what looks like the main channel. And then the wing dams underwater, or the shore protection, which is still underwater. Today we take river commerce <clears throat> in, in transportation on the upper Mississippi River for granted. <laughs> you really don't have an idea how, if, if the river were to close today and not open again, what would that mean for commodities up in the upper Midwest? What would it mean in terms of the cost of buying coal or the cost of shipping wheat? Half of the grain products in the upper Midwest move on the Mississippi River for Half of the 70 to 80 million tons of goods shipped on the upper Mississippi are grain and agricultural products, fertilizer and other products. Henry Bossy captured many of the changes on the upper Mississippi and the river that were taking place. His photograph show how the engineers first shaped the upper Mississippi River to aid commercial navigation. He shows the transformation of the Mississippi from a natural river to one that has become increasingly controlled. His photographs present the principal commerce of the Upper Mississippi River during the late 19th century, timber milling and rafting. He also shows, shows you of urban development, large and small communities on the river, those communities pushing for river development. He shows you high and low water. There are, there are photographs in this set of very low water on the Mississippi, the kind that you could walk across. He also shows you the river's working boats, the raft boats, the dredges, the phoenix and the barnard. He shows you the, the railroad and wagon bridges, the major competitors to the river. All of the, the, the above subjects, however, are subordinate to one other subject. And that's the upper Midwest effort to achieve its manifest destiny. What these photographs are, are about is the Midwest effort to become a major part of the United States economically. And, and that's it. Are there, uh, any questions at all? I know there are a lot of people who would like to get up there close and personal and look at that truck out picture. Can we go back? Oh, sure. Actually, I'm not sure. Perhaps there's uh, someone in the audience that can identify somebody. Can you hear me? I am just going to guess. Sure, that might be. I did. I did. picture I think it's that there's a building that looks like it's a brick building there's uh oh which one from the left I, I I think it's that next one this one yeah I think that's the old Merrick storehouse or what they call the old Merrick storehouse which is probably now part of um, 
the uh, S, uh, uh, S piece, what is it? Encyclopedia. Yes, I think that's part of it. Uh, there was, there is a picture in uh, Life on the Upper Mississippi by Merrick that shows the actual warehouse area. And I happened to be in the company of George Jakes one day, and he, I showed this to him, and he says, that's part of my old um, warehouse. And so there is some that is still standing today that was on that photograph. Merrick discusses those things. Well, he talks about sleeping in the upper, because that's the only way he slept in the upper story of the mm -hmm. building. Was there was a Dunbar, dan a Dunbar dance hall that had burned, and it showed a picture of that where you know it wasn't there anymore. It was quite interesting. Do we know the uh, building on the top of the church, the white church? That's, that's the Catholic, Catholic church, and then to the right of it is the rectory. Uh, is that a good enough focus? So the so first cabinet the the and the rectory yeah. on the block, okay, and then the two-towered brick building now is on that same side. I suspect that that the building in the middle that two or three story building is where Betty Houses house is where the uh, where that old hotel was in um, just just off the picture to the right would have been the Dudley Sawmill on Hermelson's Island. So the, the channel of the St. Croix and the Mississippi are... The junction is just off the picture to the left. Okay, just off. What year was this, John, this picture? This is uh, 1885. You see, that would have been before the railroad bridge even was put here. There are, there are... Uh, Three other ponies of this are in the universe set that cover the rest of 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 the rest the the that you showed um, of a city made me think it might be New Orleans. What was it? Oh, we didn't it. identify it. Not that there was a door in New Orleans. Unless someone slipped it. The water came up to large Oh, that was Davenport. Oh, really? Oh, okay, thank you. I'm sorry. That was, a, that was another case uh, I should have put that out with, of Bossy's artistic eye. He uses a boardwalk in that case to bring you right into the photograph and the set of the photograph. Do you have any idea what kind of camera you might have used? Actually, on the, on the first slide, <coughs> there's a, a drawing of this camera. And we see that camera in, a, in, a, in another situation. It's, it's a, it's a it's, it's a large format camera, they call it. The, uh, is that poster back there still? Yes. If you, if you look at that poster, uh, you might want to hold it up. Um, you see the size of that white square? That's approximately the size. You can just see inside of it, there's a light bluish tint, rectangle. Uh, that's the size of the negative. Those are a direct contact print. That means that the, the print was pretty much right on the, the glass plate. Those are glass plate negatives. And what they did with that is they, they used two chemicals. One was a potassium ferrous cyanide. That's where they get the cyan from. And another chemical. They mix those together. They put the, the, the paper on the negative and put a, a, another piece of paper over it, put it in a press, and expose it to the sun. And essentially let it cook. And then the photographer would come on, you know, back in the corner to see how developed it was and then put it back and, and wait until it was developed. And what you find in Blossy's photographs is they go from very, very light to very, very dark. And so maybe one is a little longer than the other. Where was the last sawmill up here? Up where? Uh, I mean, Fort Madison, Iowa. Fort Madison, Iowa is the last uh, sawmill on the Mississippi. Okay, where did Hudson go out? 
I'm not sure. There might, you know, I'm not exactly sure when all of those mills disappear. And, you know, you may just quit shipping on the using raft boats and kind of disappear altogether. But most of the, most of the lumber mills it's in the steam disappear by, by 1915. Mm -hmm. The ones at St. Anthony, similar to a lot of St. Anthony's in North Minneapolis, and start using rail. It's more of a finished lumber product. Yeah? Can these pictures be published? Well, there, there are four sets of these photographs right now. Each one is different. Um, one is in Rock Island District in the car. And that, that said, if you look at the photographs, they're all numbered. One, two, three, four, five, five, eight, six. The St. Paul District goes one, two, three, six, ten. We only have some of them. It's like an edited version. The one in Rock Island has every single photograph right through it. But they're missing volume two. So they're missing a third of the photographs, essentially. So they have some that we don't have, some wonderful ones of this area, and, and we have some they don't have. There's a set that was sold at Sotheby's, which has not been broken up and is being sold individually, uh, print by print, up to $10,000 of print in some cases. Um, and maybe more, imagine. And so we're going to lose that set. There's ones we don't have all together. Uh, and there's a set that's been found at the Steamboat Museum in Dubuque, Iowa, that is in the Steamboat. So that's also, so three of the four sets are in, in essentially public hands in the state. Uh, and what we hope to do is, the guy out in, who owns the book now wants to do a publication from his book. And he's a, he's got the capability to do it. He's a, a major art dealer. The Corps of Engineers, He's waffling, maybe. <laughs> we would like to publish something. And, and we're very interested in publishing something. And, and I, I think if we can convince our Washington office that's worth while, we'll do it. Um, we would like to start making the prints available to people. Um, like, especially the ones in the Prescott area today, the city of Prescott, and other uh, people. Uh, the, the problem is there's such a huge demand right now for reprints of these photographs. Uh, but we can't address it all at once. We need to develop a standard policy. You know, something, something for government talking about. <laughs> um, what, what we're trying to do is we hope within the next six months to reproduce the entire set in, in, in transparencies, which are big negatives, in black and white archival set, and get, and get reprints from all the other people who have sets so we can pull the whole thing together. And then we can make from that a, a, a copy set that can be loaned to historical societies to make reprints from at their own expense. So that's what we hope to do. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. The wing jam. Yeah. I don't know what the wing jams are. Yeah, you were very handy. Hundred years ago? Or? Well, you know, from 1878. Actually, 1874, the first two experimental wing jams go in in this area here at the end of the The first experimental wing jams go in. But from 1878 to 1930, the wing jams are built. Uh, um, and then they're all flooded by the by the navigation. Some are taken out. But if you ever if you drive along the Mississippi, sometimes and you look out and see these ripples of water going straight lines out, yeah, those are the wind bands. And I guess there are boaters who lose their pops on the side. This is fascinating the construction that you showed us all the wind bands and they were you said little trees it's just it took small saplings made them in the bundles that are this big, tied them together, and they would take a, a, a branch and stick it all the way across the bundle so they have them in a solid band that can be laid in the water. The problem with that, again, it's a, it, you might think of it as an environmental issue, is in a very short time, within the 1880s, just after they started this, they're running out of willow saplings. And they have to start looking for other trees, other kinds of saplings to use. And they start developing an experimental program to grow willow saplings. And so, I mean, we think about the environment of the river today, but the environment of the river at that time was also uh, how it was changing. Yeah, right. Yeah. Armour. You, uh, <laughs> you, you sort of ended your story of the river in the 30s, and I assume that's because the, the, the uh, budget out, ran out, but I'm kind of intrigued about what forces went together to, to form the big dams that we know now. Why, how did that all more or less come about? And I know that's a broad question. I've, I've actually written four and a half chapters of the book on that. And so I 
he does have you a lot. Yes, that's a subject. That's the area I know more about. Feel free to leave. Uh, he has had to leave at 8.30 to catch rides. If you can just have a minute to slip off. Thanks for coming. We really appreciate you. I hope you. Thank you very much. Uh, this young man. Uh, you know, interesting enough, it, it, the, the people who are behind the Nine Foot Channel project is, is the Minneapolis Real Estate Department. That is the organization. Lockendale number two at Hastings, a different story. That's completed in 1930. And that's the people of this area got together and initiated funding for that project. They put up a lot of money for the corporate for that project. That's a different, that's 1930. Fox and Dams 3 through 26 are all one new deal project. And those are the major, that's the major transformation of this city. Well, why doesn't this dam have a generator in it then? I would understand downriver after the controversy of the TDA that they wouldn't. There's not enough. Yeah, they're not high enough. Uh, we did, after the Arab oil crisis in the, in the 70s, uh, we did, a, the Corps of Engineers did an intensive study of hydropower potential in the Fox and Dams. And it came up in Lockheed Day 2, it had hydropower potential, it's not a hydropower station in there. And, but other than that, there's just not enough, uh, how much wrong with those Fox and Dams. Keokuk and Lockheed Dam 19, that was the first Lockheed Dam with hydropower in 1913 that's completed. 1917, Lock and Dam number one was completed up in St. Paul. A hydropower again, a big drop. St. Anthony Falls Locks and Dams, of course, hydro part of the Dolphin Shore there, but those Locks and Dams are built in the 50s and 60s, 1950s and 60s. But the forces that were behind, behind the, the major, all the Locks and Dams 3, 2, 2, 3, 6 are, you need an important industry in Minneapolis and the people supporting the project. Uh, NSB supported it, Pillsbury supported it, uh, the real, all the realtors supported it, all the major uh, building trades supported it. Uh, but it is, it is one of the major movements <coughs> in the upper Midwest that there is. I mean, I don't know if some, uh, you're familiar with the populist movement of the late 1880s, of the 1880s and 1890s which becomes really political, but, but there is so much political pressure that develops as a result of the project that, that they're threatening President Hoover and, and, and President uh, uh, Harding and Coolidge, uh, his predecessors, that, that they will turn, they will vote for a different party if the Republican Party doesn't come around and start supporting the project. Uh, Hoover actually supports it wholeheartedly as Secretary of Commerce and when he becomes President, President <laughs> Economic conservative, he says he can support it. Yeah, he's, he's probably one of the one of the most important responsible people in being an author. So it's FDR piece of film. Yeah. Two unrelated questions. Uh, the first one, it seems that most of the approval was done on the river after the heyday of steamboat. Right. But let me answer that in this way. And this is one of the major criticisms that the railroads had of the improvement. They said, you're not improving the Mississippi River for navigation, because you know that's not going to work. The reason you're improving the river is to create this myth that there's competition to keep railroad rates down. That's why those people out here are arguing about that navigation. They know the river's not going to work as a real transportation route. They just want it to keep as a rate maker, a rate breaker, to keep rates down. And, and finally, the Interstate Commerce Commission said, yeah, we agree. And, and so, why? The political pressure in, the in terms of the size of the population and the industry developing is enough to put pressure on Congress to get these projects going. And, it's, and he wants to, here's, it, here's the, the, the graph of, of dollars spent on the river, and here's the graph of commerce. They just go opposite, right down to less than a million tons a year by 1930 on the river. And all of that local traffic for the most part. The average, the average haul of the Mississippi River in the 19, mid-1920s is like 10 miles. And that's mainly uh, rock, sand, and gravel for improvements to the upper Mississippi River. <laughs> so that's, that's what's going on. The major commerce in the Mississippi in the 1920s is the, the, the rocks and the gravel being hauled to improve the system. What is it today? 
it's it's gone over 80 million a couple times. It's in the mid 70s to 80 million times a year. It's up right now. It's up, and I think I'm not sure where it's at this year. I saw, it, and that's the part I like to learn more about. I saw the effect of the of the happenings in Russia right now, with how much grain they might buy to determine whether Midwesterners will hold their grain in storage bins or ship it on the river. It affect how much grain uh, goes on the city this year. And this next question is just kind of a silly one. All the lock and dams are numbered. Except you get one dam and call 5K. How did that happen? 19, and this is the interesting, this just shows you the political clout that the Midwest had at this time, whether they exercised in this case. They got Congress to authorize an interim report. Con the Congressional, the House uh, would not include the bill to to include the, uh, the, the bill to include the Nova Channel Project and the Railroad Commerce Act. They refused to incorporate it. So in 1930, so it went to the Senate. The Senate was refusing to incorporate it. And in the conference, or in the committee, they convinced enough of the committee members to incorporate it, to include this in our report uh, as the final report. And then when they went back and did further engineering studies, they found it found out we better we need a lock and dam 5A, otherwise we're going to flood up with them. And they also found out we don't need lock and dam 23, I think, it's or 22. There's no lock and dam in 23. It was 22 to 23. So uh, that's that's a reason because the final report didn't come out until like 1932. What's the reason they stopped Cairo? And that was why didn't they go further south? Well, they did if they tran and early on when they transshipped to other, they would transship to bigger boats. Uh, and that was kind of the breaking point. One of the breaking points. America mentions in his book that every steamboat had to stop at uh, Galena before coming north to St. Paul. Now the river doesn't go to Galena anymore. Right. Is that a conscious move on the part of... Uh, Not the core, the river. It was a conscious move on the part of the river. <laughs> <laughs> that, that again, that happened before the river froze became a big. Galena is, 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 a, is an important trading area. It's dead by 1850, even by 1840. Um, so, it, it, it at one time is the is a San Francisco gold rush type town, and then it quickly is burned down. Any other questions? Feel free to, to contact me at my office. I have a number of deaf questions I want to know about the players at any time. We certainly do thank you very much. Yeah. person you must have had an extremely uh, exciting moment when the buyer called you and talked with you about the photo because that must have been a special photos uh, went through several levels of security from the twenty thousand dollar to the sixty <laughs> 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 it was on my desk for a while but it's not on my desk uh, tell, tell them how uh, tell them how when you travel with those uh, plates <coughs> to go through to be able to move them from one place to the next. Uh, we, we have an guard who uh, escorts us. Uh, just, for, just for your information, uh, the November-December issue of Hope Minnesota Volunteer Magazine put out by the DNR is going to uh, I'm carrying an article that I wrote essentially about this, based on some of this talk about the river change. And it's going to carry about eight or nine of the photographs. And then in February, or March or April, uh, Channel 2 uh, the Twin Cities, KTCAs, they've come in and they've filmed, spent about four and a half hours filming uh, the book. And they are going to air a show called The Mississippi Journey, and it's going to include a lot of scenes from the album. Thank you.